Hello, everybody. Can you believe it? Here we are. Method Airwaves, my podcast. This is Doug Brown. And today, I'm looking forward to this, is the 1980s podcast. That's right. We're going to go on a time machine. Are you guys ready? We're going to get into a DeLorean. We're going to go 88 miles per hour. And we're going to go back in time. Yeah. It's happening. Let's do it. Ready? And go. Ah, Here we are. We're in the 1980s. Whoa. This is the best decade ever. Ever, as they would say. I experienced the 1980s full on. Music, movies, everything. I was born in 1973, which was perfect because it timed it to where in 1980, I was seven years old. So I was just a little guy, but I experienced everything fully. I got to find myself. I found my voice. All my important development happened during this time, without a doubt. And uh, going to the very beginning here, there's so much to this decade. Uh, I mean, I'm not going to get political. I'm not going to talk about details on stuff with that. and Because I was a little kid. The stuff I paid attention to and what meant a lot to me and what was important were the movies, the music, the fashion, social, like the culture, that whole world of the 1980s I was immersed in. I had an older brother. I have an older brother. He's two years older than me. And he was a role model of sorts because he was older. And he also was immersed into the same toys, similar music. That changed later in the 1980s. But for sure in the beginning, we were breakdancing and wearing the parachute pants and playing the same handheld video games and Atari. Boy, I can go on and on. But let's narrow this down. First and foremost, the president was Ronald Reagan in 1981. He went from 1981 through 1989. So he was the guy. He was the president that we all knew was an actor. And that was a big uh, thing. Of course, if you've seen the movie Back to the Future, which we will talk about, they uh, mention that. Doc Brown is showing Marty McFly uh, on TV. He's watching movies, black and white movies with Ronald Reagan. And Marty McFly is saying, what, the president, that's him? And Doc Brown is going, the president? Now I know you're lying to me. There's no way an actor is going to become a president. And sure enough, he did. So, early 1980s, as a little boy, I was into baseball and things like that. I remember 1980 and 1981 very well. I remember thinking it was cool that it was the early 80s and here I was, this little boy. My parents, they were into music like ABBA, Herb Albert, my dad, a connoisseur of classical music, and my mom, she could be heard singing show tunes, she played the piano, and things of that nature. And I had some neighbors that had 45 records, if you know what 45s are. LPs, albums, and uh, a lot of influence came from neighbors and people in school. And uh, yeah, music was first and foremost, I think, my entryway into what was cool. And in the early 1980s, we had so much. We had Michael Jackson, huge, the album Thriller we'll talk about in a little bit. And I got into Duran Duran, U2, NXS. It was kind of a synth pop new wave time in the early 80s. Now, there were two segments to the 80s as far as I'm concerned and what I've experienced. If you've seen the movie Hot Tub Time Machine with John Cusack, they kind of missed the mark. Entertaining movie, funny. I loved parts of it because they went back to the 80s. Yeah. But 
they kind of had some things that were incorrect. And that's important to, to note. Uh, for example, I think it's towards the end of the film, in the grand finale, you see everybody wearing neon, and Poison is on stage, I believe playing Talk Dirty to Me or Ain't Nothing But a Good Time, one of those songs. And everybody's breakdancing. And people were not breakdancing on the whole in 1988-89. Parachute pants were not popular then. That stuff had completely kind of gone to the wayside. So we have the the early 1980s. I'd say up until 87, actually. So the first few seven years of 1980 was pretty new wave synth pop. Metal was still big. It was there. But everything shifted from 97 or I'm sorry, 1987 towards the end of the decade, it the neon stuff and that stuff kind of fizzled. There was some great lingo that people would use in speaking in the 1980s, especially the young people like myself at the time. Oh, so many words. Words like gnarly, gnarly dude, which came back. Awesome was big, which is popular now. But I remember when awesome first kind of, you'd hear people say it on the news and it was a new word. The word awesome and yeah, it's the way people said it too. That was important. Gnarly, radical, choice. Ferris Bueller said that a lot. So choice. Just like that. I used that word a lot probably when I was about 12 or 13. Everything was choice if it was cool or whatever. And Shaw. You say Shaw. Shaw. Well, kind of like that. Not quite sure what that completely meant. And the word Totally which was kind of from the late 70s, but it made a resurrection in the 80s. Totally, totally tubular, which is a uh, valley girl talk, which I didn't use. I was a boy, and if you Google it or YouTube it, it's pretty funny, valley girl talk. Like, gag me with a pitchfork with a spoon, and it had this certain like rhythm to it, which is funny now. Funny then to me also. And a funny expression my brother and I used to say all the time was face. Face. You'd go up to somebody and go, face. My brother did this a lot, which the way he did it was annoying because it was always kind of like face in your face. And you would take your hand and claw it to somebody's face. That was popular. And of course, Rubik's Cubes were huge. The puzzle of its day. They also made something called the Rubik Snake which was kind of shaped like a ball. And it was a snaky thing. But the Rubik's Cube was big. It was just a cube, it was a square. And it was hard though. You would see people do it real fast and these like genius prodigies that could do them real fast with their hands, left, right hand, and done in like two minutes. But normal people, my brother and I, we had not a lot of success. We could do one color or we could do a couple, two or three sides. Maybe we could put a dot in the middle. But for the most part, you know what most people did with the Rubik's Cubes? Two things. They figured out they could take the stickers off. That was the easiest. And you could always tell when somebody did it because the stickers were never put on properly. Or you could get a screwdriver, pop it in there, and the pieces would all fall apart and you could put it back together. Other than that, it became a novelty. I still have a couple of Rubik's Cubes, fun little puzzles, brain teasers, stress relief if you just want to go back and forth on that. And that was big. Uh, other than having the Star Wars toys, I mean, we had matchbox cars and we had all kinds of stuff, He-Man toys. For girls, though, it was Cabbage Patch Kids. Whoa, those were really popular. When they first came out, you could see on the news, people were climbing over each other around Christmas time to get a Cabbage Patch Kid. It was a big deal. Everybody had to have a Cabbage Patch Kid. Of course, I had no interest in them, but people were just like clawing over each other to get their own Cabbage Patch Kid. Another entryway for a lot of people, I mean a lot of people, to the 1980s and what was cool with music in particular was MTV which launched in 1981 with the song Video Killed the Radio Star. And I definitely remember the intro of the MTV. Dun, 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 dun. It had uh, the man with the flag on the moon. 
and the flag was MTV and real retro -y cool. So MTV, that was literally the social media, the Facebook of the day. It's how everybody connected. Everybody was watching MTV. We didn't have the internet or Facebook or any social media we could jump on and connect with other people in that way. But MTV connected a lot of people. It put out a lot of bands and the visuals, videos. I mean, I didn't know it at the time, but what a genius marketing idea for these record companies to promote their uh, artists. Because before, up until that time, everything was just the radio, which I didn't listen to the radio a whole lot. I had a lot of tapes and records. But MTV, turn on the TV and boom, all of a sudden you're watching some storyline or some band. If you watch some of those videos, some of them are horrible. Some of them are awesome. Duran Duran, pretty much every video they made was just out of this world. They were like little movies. You watch Hungry Like the Wolf and uh, that video looks like Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. And uh, yeah, cool stuff. Speaking of Duran Duran, I mean, that was a, a group that I got into early as far as being really passionate about. I had a neighbor, Diane Frank, and she had a bunch of those 45 records. And she had played, what was it? She had the Reflex on 45. And I remember hearing that and thinking, wow, this is cool. I can bop to this. I can dance to this. But I, I remember watching the video on MTV and scoring that. You have YouTube today. You can type in whatever you want and ha. Ah, the video is there. But back then, you had to catch it. Much like the radio. You had to sit and kind of wait. And you'd hear it in the background. You'd run towards the TV and just be glued to it. And I was such a fan of this band in the beginning. They were so colorful and free and they were just cool dudes. What I did, since I didn't have their album yet, I had a little cassette tape recorder. I put stickers all over it and it was all cool. And I took that tape recorder up to the television when that reflex song started and right away and I pressed record. Took it right up to the little speaker and song would stop, press stop on my tape recorder. Whoa, I just scored something free. Press rewind, quality wasn't great. But when you're that young, I could care less. The song, I had it. And I played that over and over and over. The reflex, flex, 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 damn. You've gone too far. This, I'm not gonna sing all these 80s songs, but I was hooked, fell in love with that band. And that got me really, uh, just into kind of new wave pop and I started to listen to Howard Jones a lot. Check out Howard Jones, also known as Hojo. He's still rocking. I've seen that guy a hundred times in concert and uh, I could relate to him because he was a, a solo artist. He uh, looked like a relative of mine. He looked like a mix between my father and my brother. So there was that whole thing, but he played piano. That was his main instrument and I grew up hearing my mom play piano all the time. She was very accomplished at the instrument. But I also looked at it as a toy. I mean, I'm so fortunate to have that in the home because it was a toy I could play on and I could experiment. And I fell in love with the piano. I was really self-taught. I took maybe two lessons, which went horrible because the lady was 100 years old and she wanted to teach me Mary Had a Little Lamb and I wanted to play the Reflex or Howard Jones songs like Things Can Only Get Better. So I remember one day, a little quick story, she'd come to the house and it was time for my lesson. Where's Doug? Where's Doug? I climbed up a tree in the backyard. True story. And that tree was big. I would never do that now. I climbed all the way up and I remember hearing them echo in the backyard. Doug, Doug. So that's how much I liked piano lessons. So I came down the tree and that ended, but boy, I was always, my hands were always on those keys, playing, experimenting, and learning that instrument. 
And Howard Jones was all about keyboards. So synthesizers, there's a word that was cool in the 1980s. I love that word. I remember learning how to spell it, thinking I can spell synthesizer, and I was trying to impress my third grade teacher. And uh, we didn't have laptops, so you couldn't just press a couple buttons. And like, here's your drum beats, here's this, multi-track. It, it wasn't like that. I would have to go to the local music store, which I spent a lot of time at, Larry's Music Note. And my first keyboard was a little, geez, it was maybe three feet long Casio keyboard. And I still have those keyboards. They knew how to make a product. They still work. But they didn't have a lot of options. You'd have like 10 drum beats and these cheesy little sounds on the keyboard. But at the time, it was like magic. It was gold. It, it fed my addiction. And my second keyboard was another Casio. That's all I had, Casio keyboards. And that one was maybe like four feet. So it was pretty cool. But at the time, the keys were maybe, ah, geez, maybe two inches. They were a little less, maybe an inch. They were really small. Yeah, they were small, but my hands were small. It was perfect at the time. And I loved music, so I played this all the time. And I was very creative as a little guy. So I would multi-track. Again, now you can take a laptop, smartphone, press a couple buttons, and wow, you have a, an album in a half hour. But then I didn't have any multi-tracking, so I would take a couple tape recorders. I would take my... Casio keyboards, cardboard drums, and I would record a track on that cassette tape. And then I would take that to the other tape recorder and I'd press record on that and it would play my previously recorded stuff. And then I would do another track. I'd maybe sing on top of that. So after doing this three or four times, <laughs> the beginning of every song sounded like Psh! it had all this static and fuzz. But who cares? I was multi-tracking, making my own songs. And so we have the merge of music, MTV, which was big, big, big. And that was my entrance into the 1980s. And after discovering groups like Duran Duran and Howard Jones and a few other groups, break dancing happened. Break dancing. What? Where do I begin on breakdancing? I discovered breakdancing probably 1983 or so before I discovered skateboarding. And to me, the two have always been similar for a number of reasons. The creative elements, the physical aspect, and the fun. My brother and I were just break dancers. We got into this. Uh, something that actually inspired this podcast, I was listening to the soundtrack of a uh, Flashdance. Yes, Flashdance. I saw that in the theater. We'll get to that in a minute. But that made me think there were breakdancers in that. And like, wow, the 1980s. Yes, this is gold. I get very em emotional, sentimental. I have a an attachment to the 1980s, an emotional attachment, because it was such a, a great time. Anyhow, I'm getting off track here. Breakdancing. We were good. My brother and I were really good. I think... I passed him up though. I had a little more hunger and skill and I could dance. I'm not going to lie. I was a little dude that dug a drum beat. And I'd hear a song and I was not afraid to dance. So break dancing was perfect. I'd do the wave with my arms, the worm, shoulder spins, back spins, head spins. We would do almost, you know, acrobatic stuff. We were little gymnasts in disguise. And my, my father, quick story here, he bought a record of Herbie Hancock, Future Shock, it was called. As much as he listened to classical music, he would buy some stuff that was kind of hip and cool. And I think he knew of Herbie Hancock because he was a jazz artist, but all of a sudden he put out this record that was awesome. It had the song Rocket on it. Hello, that song for me was amazing. The first time, this man, I remember this like it was yesterday. The first time I ever put headphones on a Walkman, if you don't know what a Walkman is, a cassette player that's portable, 
I put that on. I'll never forget this. And I played Herbie Hancock's Rocket. I remember literally buzzing like I took some drug or something. This adrenaline went through me. Goosebumps. And I was buzzing. It was the coolest sound. I cranked it up and the song is awesome. Just instrumental. Dun 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 just rock it. Had like robot voices and that scratching. That's was new then. And so I fell in love with that tune. But what did I do with that song? There was a talent show at my elementary, Leighton Elementary. And uh First time I was ever in the talent show, I believe, was 1981, first grade or so. I did ventriloquist stuff. I had a little puppet, Charlie McCarthy. And so I fell in love with the stage. I talk about that a great deal in my first podcast. They did it every other year. So by the time I was in third grade, 1983 or so, it was time for another talent show. So what was I going to do? I wanted to do something wild, cool, creative, and original. Big surprise. What do I do? I'm going to break dance. But not only am I going to break dance, I'm going to juggle. I grew up in a juggling family, which was fun. My dad got my brother and I into this. And like the break dancing thing, I, I had a strong hunger and maybe more time on my hands than my dad and my brother because I was always playing with toys or whatever. So I got really good at juggling and I passed my dad and my brother up. I was doing four balls. I was doing pins and so what I do I for that talent show I combined break dancing and juggling and I came up with the title the electric juggler and I made the little poster board with the artwork and they put it out when I came out and that was awesome uh, it's a funny little video I watch it now and I can't even believe it's me I, I couldn't probably do half of that stuff now or be as consistent because at that talent show I mean you have one go at this you're I was juggling I, I could have dropped one ball one pin I did something I definitely probably wouldn't do now I had maybe it was two feet long I had a stick that I balanced on my nose and I spun a plate on the top of it now that thing could have gone in my eye or anything a lot could have happened could have hit me on the head and could have passed out and Maybe my future would have changed, but I nailed everything and got a good applause, and that was fun. Fell in love with the stage, and I became a childhood actor, making a long story short. During that time period, I was cast as Tom Sawyer in a pretty prestigious uh, program that came to town of Akron Children's Theater, and I, I got discovered, and I did a bunch of plays after that, and I went as far as to uh, take dance lessons I was so much into break dancing, and the director of that, Tom Sawyer, Francine Leroy, she had a dance studio. So I said, well, why not? You know, I was a little apprehensive at first because typically you walk into a dance studio and it's all girls. And I'm thinking, man, I'm not wearing tights. I just want to break dancing. I'm down with break dancing. But I got a pair of sweatpants and I took jazz dance. That's what it was, jazz, which was great. The music we were learning dance stuff to was all the stuff I was into. And uh, that was important to get into that. And she, uh, Francine, went as far as to let me teach a class. I mean, I was only maybe nine or so. And I was teaching people how to break dance. Looking back, that was pretty cool. Uh, it probably planted the seed for being a teacher as a guitar teacher years later, which I, I did in the, from 90, 1992 to 2002, I was a guitar teacher, but I remember teaching breakdancing. So, electric juggler, breakdancing, golden times. What we did with breakdancing is we had cardboard, that we cardboard boxes we'd flatten out, maybe at the playground, and we had a boom box. I mean, this stuff is real. It happened. If you watch videos or it's often mimicked. You see people carrying boom boxes on their shoulders and stuff. But no, that really happened. The shoulder spins, all that. And I saw the movie Breakin' during that time period. You got to see Breakin'. I fell in love with that movie. I think I saw that after Flashdance. The movie Breakin' was huge. I mean, it had this dude. What was his name? 
Ah, Ozone and Turbo. And Turbo is the one that did this really cool dance with the broom. He made it elevate. And it was to the song Tour de France. Yeah. Man, I had that cassette tape. I was all about breaking the movie. With the rising popularity of breakdancing came rap. The two went together really well. And with the dancing and the beats, rap became really popular. And my brother and I embraced this, especially my brother. He was really into it. And we would listen to groups like Houdini. They did a song called The Freaks Come Out at Night. And a group called Fat Boys. And definitely Run DMC. We were into them. A lot of songs there. And with that, we started our own rap group called Fight, which was appropriate. I came up with the title, of course because we were fighting all the time. But with our microphone on our generic little big boom box cassette recorder and my dad's record player, which we would do the scratching, the and we started our own group and made our own original songs with those elements. What a fun time though. And I still have those recordings. Our voices are real high because we were so young and rapping about life and funny stuff. Dancing was so popular, I mean, with movies like Footloose, Fame, definitely Flashdance. So with breakdancing and just dancing in general, it was really popular. Also, roller skating made a big comeback in the early, mid-1980s and onward. It was really popular. I mean, it was the place for us to go to. The Skateland was the club. It's where you could meet people. For me and my friends, it was all about we can meet girls from other towns. I mean, wow. They'd have these all-night skates, which were pretty funny looking back. You leave your house, your parents say, okay, we'll see you at 7 in the morning. And we got away with a lot of mischief at those all-night skates, indeed. Probably they're stricter now, but back then, I mean, the only thing they wouldn't let us do is leave. And great memories of roller skating. I still roller skate to this day because of that time period, much like skateboarding, something I'd picked up and excelled at, and I still do to this day. And the music was great. I mean, to roller skate too. Lots of memories of the all night skates and loved roller skating, still do. And also during that time, Michael Jackson, back to that, was huge. I mean, the first time I ever saw Michael Jackson, I'll never forget this, it was, in the evening, my dad was watching TV and he had the newspaper and I was playing with matchbox cars or something. And the date on this was May 16th, 1983. On NBC, the TV was on. There was a show called Motown 25 Years, Today and Forever. Okay, it's on in the background. And all of a sudden, you hear this drum beat. Ooh, ooh, ooh. My dad takes his newspaper. He looks up at the TV. I turn around, done playing with my toys for a second. We were like hypnotized. What was on the screen? It was Michael Jackson. And that song was Billie Jean. And he was doing the whole, he had the hat, the fedora, and he threw it across the stage. And busted into this song and we were like what did we just see I'm not kidding you and the whole world was doing this if you experience this you know what I'm talking about it was a movement something happened in fact the next day in the newspaper there was an, an article about it so it really it touched a lot of lives it reached a lot of people me included because breakdancing was just kind of coming into fruition it was getting ready to just explode and then he brings it to the table and shows people the moonwalk, which, wow, we didn't have a VCR quite yet. Had we, we would rewind that and watch that in slow motion. So the moonwalk was big. Everybody was doing the moonwalk. And breakdancing kind of got popular in pop culture, really. And uh, that worked for me. All of a sudden, I was part of a scene. I was breakdancing. I was into music, into movies. Movies. What movies was I into? The 1980s was one of the golden eras of cinema, without a doubt. All the classics. 
I mean, look now today. How many movies are they remaking? They've remade, tried to remake like Footloose. They tried to redo the movie Fame. Come on, folks. If it's not broke, don't fix it. It's like trying to recreate the first Star Wars or The Wizard of Oz. Don't do it. You're wasting your time. Or Annie. The original Annie came out in the 80s and they've redone that too many times. So the movie I really got into in the beginning was, of course, Star Wars. I did a whole podcast about this. Star Wars actually did come out in 1977. So how it became 80s was the fact that it was a huge hit. Huge, huge hit. And the sequel era started. All of a sudden we have sequels to movies and it was successful. So that took us into, I believe, 1981 is when The Empire Strikes Back came out. And I was one of the lucky guys to uh, be sitting in that chair in the theater watching the screen, not knowing that Darth Vader, in fact, was Luke Skywalker's father. So I'm watching this and I hear the, Luke, I am your father. Our jaws hit the floor. We had no idea. That's when I knew, wow, these movies are deep, man. We're This is family. There's, there's a, a connection here. It carried a lot of weight because now you have a father-son story. And So Star Wars, I'm not going to spend an hour talking about that because I did that in my episode two. Check that out if you want to get nerded and geeked out. I waved the flag pretty strong in that podcast about Star Wars. But it's true, the toys, that, that almost all our toys were Star Wars stuff. And we got into He-Man. We could talk about toys, the Rubik's Cubes, Transformers, G.I. Joe figures. Wow. So let's go back to the movie topic. So many great, great movies and trilogies happen in the 1980s. We have, obviously, the Star Wars trilogy, which we thought when Return of the Jedi came out that that was really the end, not knowing that six more films in the future would come. No idea. We thought it was concluded and it was over by uh, the end of Return of the Jedi. And we have... The Indiana Jones trilogy, Raiders of the Lost Ark, that movie was ginormous. And that movie came out in between, I believe, Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. George Lucas and Steven Spielberg went on a trip together, a vacation after filming those movies, and they both came up with the idea to do this movie, Indiana Jones. It was Spielberg's baby, but Lucas got involved and put those two guys in a room, man. And make some movies. I wish they would do that now. Where's movies? Where's the classics? There's a few out there, but nothing beat those. So I experienced those in the theater. The Indiana Jones trilogy. Wonderful. Good stuff. And Back to the Future. There's another trilogy. Back to the Future. Since we're back in time, we might as well talk about that movie. Back to the Future played a pivotal part in in my skateboarding. Skateboarding wasn't as big back in the 80s as it is now. As far as being popular and you can't just, back then you couldn't just go to a store and buy a complete skateboard. I mean, you might be able to find an old junker kind of 1970s deal or go to a garage sale, but no. I saw the movie Back to the Future, which I fell in love with instantly. What's not to like? Marty McFly, one of the best movies. And uh, towards the beginning of that film, Marty is leaving Doc's house. He's going down the driveway. And what is he going down on? He is going down on a skateboard. He's got it on his feet. And I'm watching that going, okay, that is cool. What? What? At the time, I was into traditional sports like baseball, basketball. But I never thought really skateboarding. Like, it's a team of one. There's no rules. It's creative. It looks fun skateboarding. If there's anything I can say about it, it's fun. To this day, the elements are the same as far as what I like about it. And Marty McFly paved the way for me a bit because it got me thinking, man, I need to get one of those. I want a real board. Not this like banana board from the 1970s that you can sit on and 
It's maybe like a foot long. No, I wanted a real skateboard. So I got my first skateboard after uh, seeing that. And skateboarding in the 1980s, I mean, I could talk about this topic for hours and we'll do a separate thing about that. And I talk a great deal about it in my first episode of my podcast. There's so much to skateboarding. But I discovered skateboarding and started skateboarding in 1986 or so, which a lot of people did. It was new at the time. It wasn't so big and trendy and mainstream like it is now. It was a subculture. If you'd see somebody wearing a skateboard shirt at the mall or something, you were instantly brothers. You had a connection. You weren't enemies. You were like, whoa, what's up? Welcome to the club. You know, it was that whole thing. And my first pro model skateboard that I got from California Cheapskates catalog out of California was a Kevin Staub Pirate. My first pro board that I had. Big wheels. I mean, boards back then were different than they are today, although they've made a comeback. They were primarily 10 inches wide, 32 or 33 inches long, and it was a colorful time. It was a great time to be a skateboarder because stylistically there were no rules. I mean, now things are a little more clone-like and everybody has trick names, And but in the 80s it was all about creativity. There was no rules. It was fun. It was colorful. Hair was crazy. Fashion was crazy. With skateboarding. Look at Tony Hawk or Christian Hasoy. If you look up those guys and their videos back in the 80s, there was a great movement going on. I was really into the Bones Brigade, which was popular. I identified with Tony Hawk because I had that haircut. I had my bangs that went across my face and bleached blonde hair. And again, there's a lot to this topic that we'll save for another podcast. There were just so many movies in the 80s. I mean, where to begin? Stand By Me, Footloose, The Goonies, which I'd loved for a number of reasons. I I was the same age as the actor, so I could identify with him. I mean, they knew how to, Spielberg knew how to make these movies back then, as far as casting, and he, the fashion was the same as what we were rocking. Uh, On Golden Pond was one of my favorite movies when I was really young. That came out in the real early 80s. I think today's audience, a kid, you watch that and they might fall asleep and think, wow, this is lame, this is horrible, but I loved dramas at that age, and that movie, to this day, is one of my favorites. The movie Amadeus, I mean, as a little kid, that that was like a three-hour movie, it was about Mozart, and the music spoke to me. I talked about those Casio keyboards earlier after watching that movie in the theater. All these movies I keep mentioning, by the way, putting my hand up right now. I saw him in the theater, very fortunate. After seeing Amadeus though, I was inspired musically and I it inspired me to be original and to, to write my own music that planted that seed. Uh, Ghostbusters, saw that when it came out around my birthday. A bunch of friends and I went to that. And of course all the John Hughes movies. How can we t- exclude these? We have what, Breakfast Club? 16 Candles, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. What a great movie. I remember going to that with my family. My mom and dad sat behind my brother and I because we were too cool, I guess, to sit with them. And Anyhow, I learned something during that movie, though. My dad always told us, stay for the credits. We're like, you know, come on, let's go. The movie's over. It's just words flying down a screen. But no, he said, just stay for the credits. He always made us do that. And to this day, I always stay for the credits. You know, out of respect. And the movie's not over, man. There's still music going. But I learned the art of the last clip. Stick around for your movies once in a while. And Ferris Bueller, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, had one of the best clips ever. So the theater's empty because we're the only people still in there. And the credits finish. And all of a sudden... You see Matthew Broadwick, the actor that played Ferris Bueller, standing there in a robe. He's just getting out of the shower, and he's in his hallway, and he goes, Go home. Go home. The movie's over. But that was it. And then the movie ended. But still, it was a last clip, and it was a bonus feature, you know, that you scored. So that's a memory I have about that particular film. Great, great movie. And, of course, we can't forget... E.T. E.T. came out in, 
believe, in 1982. So I was probably like eight or nine. And I remember that movie for a million reasons. The main thing, like I said with Goonies, I was the same age as the main actor who played Elliot in E.T. And during that time, I was doing dance and theater and was an actor, as a childhood actor. So I was really relating to this actor and the character in the movie with what he was going through. We were the same age. He had the speak and spell. He had all the toys. He'd look in the bedroom and it was all Star Wars toys, which was Steven Spielberg winking to George Lucas. If you watch their movies, they do that quite a bit to each other. But seeing E.T., it was the first time in the movie theater that I ever teared up. And I was kind of embarrassed about it. I remember I was with my friends and the guy next to me, I was, oh, I was sinking in my chair thinking, I hope he doesn't see this. Because, I mean, if you have a heart and compassion and watch that film, no matter what age, especially in the theater, in that environment, in that time period, how can you not get emotionally involved with E.T.? And it was towards the end when he was dying and the, Elliot is crying. And E.T., represented a lot it represented you know home it made you think of your family maybe pets things that you cared for stuffed animals that you thought were kind of real when you're a kid so it tugged at my heartstrings and i cried and i'll never forget that et was a, a heavy film a great movie we could do a whole podcast probably on that movie so in the 1980s no shortage of great cinema entertainment but not only that, we had the TV. That was our, you know, centerpiece in the home in the 1980s, uh, having a television. You'd have the TV guide, if you remember that, folks. Wow. We would uh, definitely schedule out what we watched. We'd have this day, we'd watch that. And today we have Netflix and 18,000 other options to watch TV shows. But then it was like NBC, 7 o'clock. Thursday, you would be in school counting down the hours until that TV show aired live. And so many shows, Growing Pains, Silver Spoons, Different Strokes, so many, Cosby Show, Roseanne. For me, my favorite in the early 80s was the TV show Fame. There was a movie that came out before that. That was maybe the late 70s, early 80s, something like that. But it was a success, so they made a spinoff of the, the movie. It was called Fame, same title. And boy, did I fall in love with that. Because again, I was this actor kid. I was dancing, I was singing, I was playing instruments. And Fame fit perfectly because it was a school Per, for performing arts or high school kids and I identify with the character Danny for sure Danny Amatulo played by Carlos Imperata now why was Danny important because Danny I didn't know it at the time but he was such a role model and a mentor and that character I followed everything he did and his clothes he was into what was it, uh, the Miami Dolphins, so I like the Miami Dolphins. I mean, this guy was singing, dancing. He kind of looked like me, too. We had the same vocal range. He was an older version of me. So I wanted to be Danny, and I watched that show. It was on NBC every Thursday from 8 p.m. to 9 p.m., and I would watch that religiously every week. In fact, I can even remember the week I missed one time. We had a school program. I think it was a Christmas program. And it was on a Thursday. And I remember singing, thinking in front of the audience, thinking, oh, right now fame is playing and I'm missing it. And this is the worst moment of my life. I was traumatized. Not really. But we couldn't record it because we didn't have a VCR yet. VCR, you ask yourself, what is a VCR? A video cassette recorder. We got a VCR finally, and I will never forget this as well. It was a magic box. It was like, what? The idea that you could take something from the television and put it on this 
video cassette. I know it seems strange now because you can duplicate anything, you can I mean the sky's the limit with technology, but back then this was it felt like magic. It's like talking to somebody that got in a car for the first time when cars were first invented and they, my grandma ex described being in a car the first time was like magic. Well, this was like magic for my generation. And the first time we ever videotaped something from the TV, we tested it out. My dad got this huge clunky thing. I mean, it was ginormous, big gray machine, RCA. And there was a basketball game on and we pressed record and we let it go for a little bit and then stop and then rewind and then play. And there it was on the screen. It was magic. It was cool because this was in your home. We could now watch any TV show and save it. We could record it. And we did that all the time. We had so many VHS tapes laying around and little labels and clunky loud things, but that's what people watch movies on for sure. Go to any Goodwill, you will see hundreds of VHS tapes. People still watch these. You can still find the recorders. I still have mine. I have a couple and VHS. The technology of the day. Speaking of technology, the 80s had a lot of it. Let's talk about video game systems because that's fun. As a young kid, my brother and I, we loved video games, especially my brother. I think my brother had a problem like an alcoholic would going to a bar. My brother would, instead of going to a bar, his outlet was the arcade. There was a Fisher Big Wheel store that they had an arcade between the IGA store and this Fisher Big Wheel, which was the Walmart of its day. But my brother, he would get quarters any way he could, and he would have a whole bag. No, it was a hat. It was a winter hat, and it was filled with quarters. So he was, like, all into it. If you see the movie The Last Starfighter, the very beginning of that, there's a guy. It's all about videos. and That was my brother. Or Tron, if you watch the movie Tron. There's a good 80s movie, Tron. So he got me into video games. But he was really into it. And he, Dragon Slayer, he could master, if you remember that. And I mean, up until the time, there's pinball machines. But this was the explosion of video games. They were the upright stand-up, put 25 cents in. Everything was 25 cents in the 80s. It was cool. There was a time period where I felt like I had a lot of money as a kid because you could buy a candy bar for 25 cents. You got a video game for 25 cents. A pop was 25 cents. Now... My brother, video games. I was into Pac-Man, Miss Pac-Man. Played that a lot. But we wanted more, so what did Steve Jobs get going? The whole Atari happened. Yes, Atari. We were a bit ahead of our time because my dad had bought something before Ataris came out. My dad was cool like that. He was cutting edge. And he went to Radio Shack and bought this little system called Pong. Okay, Pong. What is Pong? You ready for me to describe Pong? It will take two seconds. You got a screen. On the left side, there is a bar. On the right side, there is a bar. In the middle of that screen, there's a line that vertically goes up and down. Now, those two lines on the side will hit a little ball back and forth. That's it. If somebody misses the ball, the other person gets a point. Simple, right? No, no, no. We thought it was the coolest thing in the world because you had this little controller. It's just a little lever. It wasn't a joystick. And you could go up and down and you could move that line on the screen. That was magic too. Like, what? This is crazy. Are we jumping in the television? This is space age stuff. But Atari came along a few years after Pong. The Atari 2600. There's some good documentaries about this game system. There's a huge history behind it. But when that came out, it was big, big, big. Because we could now play these video games at home. Granted, they were generic versions of Frogger, Space Invaders, Pac-Man. But they came out with really cool games like Pitfall, Adventure, Berserk. Oh, there's so many. And we would play that hours and hours on end thinking it was just the best thing in the world because we didn't have to put quarters in. Now when games came out, they weren't cheap. I do remember that. They were like 30 bucks a pop. Space Invaders was $30 when it came out back then. 
So that's like buying a game for 60 bucks now. So some more technology in the kitchen. Microwaves came out. Up until this time, I remember vividly, it would always be a special treat if we had TV dinners. So these clunky metal things you'd stick in the oven, have to wait 25, 30 minutes, and you would get scorching hot corn or this, they had this dessert, there was like this apple cinnamon thing that always burnt your mouth. So we did TV dinners, great, but the microwave came out and I'll never forget getting our first microwave. I believe it was a Magic Chef it was called, this brown small unit that was really wild because you could now put anything in it and like popcorn or whatever, press two minutes and there you go. We, my brother and I, my friends, got crazy. We thought it was just so cool. We would take anything. We'd make these like Frankenstein sandwiches. We would take Swiss cheese and bologna, anything we'd take and put it in there and just like fry it and eat it and think, wow, this is amazing. And some school technology, how things have changed. You go into a school now and it's like a space station. Like, hello, they got these screens and teachers with microphones and computers, this and that. Pretty high tech stuff. When I was in school, it was pretty traditional. Thank goodness, because I prefer that. You have a chalkboard, you have a, an individual, a teacher that's speaking to the kids. We have books, we write, we read. Not that they don't do that now, but indeed, kids read and write, I think less now than they did in my day. We had calculators, solar calculators, solar calculators. Now, when I first got my solar calculator, I thought this is the future. Whoa, how is this, you know, the sunlight? I'll never forget it. I thought that in the future, everything would be solar panels and this and that, which it exists today, yes, folks, but not on the level I thought it would. I figured just everything would be solar power. But of course, the powers that be won't let that happen because if you want to buy a solar panel for your house, you're going to probably pay more than you would for a mansion. Speaking of schools, we can't go through the 80s without mentioning NASA and the space shuttle. Space was like so cool with Star Wars and everything. My generation was really curious about space. I think today it's, it's not a huge deal. I mean, I think kids are curious, but not on the level that we were. When the space shuttle would go up, it was always a huge event. I mean, be on TV, live TV. My grandparents were down in Florida and they were always bragging like, hey, we saw the space shuttle in person go up like it was seeing Elvis or something. And we would go, what? No way. So that's changed. And with the space shuttle, something tragic happened in 1986. I think I was in sixth grade. And they wanted to relate to kids, so they put a teacher up in space, on the space shuttle. So, this was a tragedy and a half. I mean, they're gonna put a teacher in space, right? And they're gonna air it live, television, to schools throughout the nation. And they did that, and my class happened to be at recess or something. I remember we had missed it, and it was good my particular class did because that space shuttle exploded it blew up so all these kids were like traumatized by it i mean it, it was a, a horrible thing for these kids to see how do you change that around when they see you know they said well that could be my mom that could be my teacher going up there and so there was a lot of therapy sessions probably taking place and speeches in schools i remember they spoke to us and yeah, but it also at a young age made me think of death and stuff. I'd always been aware of that topic, but it was an intro to that indeed for a lot of kids because it's a tragedy. It's terrible. The teacher going up in space and losing their life. So oh, on a brighter note, let's talk about fashion. David Bowie's song, fa, 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 fashion. The fashion in the 80s was wild and awesome. And great, but so great, it was awesome, if that makes sense. Looking back, because everything was big and colorful, especially in the early 80s. 
one word can sum up the 80s hair big hair fit the big 80s without a doubt i was a little boy so my hair was pretty tom cruise ish if you've seen top gun in fact when top gun came out people always told me i had real dark hair then and people told me i looked like him when i smiled a lot i got that which is kind of funny so my hair was just my hair, uh, but if you were a girl back in the 80s, you scrunchies, primping, crimping, I guess it's called. I'm not an expert on this. And they had the claw. I definitely remember the claw, especially junior high. The girls had this claw that came out. Like the higher the hair, the better. I don't know if they thought that it made them taller maybe. Because if you look at my yearbooks, and especially in junior high, 1987 and 1988, the frame of the picture like you had to fit the hair it was just this whole thing and i guess they would spray it and a lot of hairspray and mousse although i was guilty of using mousse before in junior high this product called pizzazz i think it was and it was gold and had sparkles in it what was i thinking i wanted the color more than trying to keep my hair in like check or whatever i was doing so I really remember putting that in my hair in the morning. It smelled. I'll never forget that smell. And during class, I'd have this like glitter on my hands. And I graduated from that to sun in. That's what I was using to bleach my hair by this time in junior high. If you were around in the 80s, you remember the product sun in. It was the bleach of all. It was just the great stuff. And they made super sun in. There was the yellow bottle which was sun in and then it was like a reddish bottle that was the super sun in and yeah we're going to use the super sun in and we're going to do my bangs and I'm going to let them grow long in front of my eyes and I had this whole thing going on I'm going to shave my uh what did I shave my sideburns to be straight and so that was happening uh rugby shirts I can talk a lot about fashion in grade school it was like parachute pants adidas shirts stuff like that and I always seem to have a lot of t-shirts that had movies on them. And it's all come back. You go to Walmart right now or all these stores, retro stuff is back. But junior high and high school, uh, we would peg our jeans. What does pegging jeans mean? You got to Google this. I can still do it to this day. Uh, you take your jeans, you wrap it tight around the ankles, and you take the right side and you squeeze it real tight. And then you fold over the bottom and you roll it up kind of up the calf there and you have peg jeans which now kind of look funny I think I, I don't know but I can still do it that's how often we did do it every morning get up peg the jeans tight jeans I should say which have made a comeback too and stonewash everything's made a comeback it's all cool again but there were years where it wasn't cool if you're rocking neon I had some neon a lot of that kind of stuff turtlenecks sweaters Hawaiian shirts, collars up, polo shirts, like the collar up, like Tom Cruise and Risky Business. Fashion was happening. It was all over the place, especially with bands. That new wave pop stuff was so popular. And their fashion, I'd mentioned Duran Duran earlier, was wow. It was loud. It was colorful. It was creative. There were basically no rules in the 80s. If you look at the fashion, I mean... You could leave the house with some wild stuff, and people did. Jean jackets, that was my outfits there towards the later 80s. You know, things were definitely different in the later 80s, and I was older too because I was a teenager at this time, and I wore for, uh, geez, 1988 to 89. I mean, my outfit was jean jacket with a ton of buttons on it of bands like Poison, Motley Crue, ACDC, Guns N' Roses, and my jeans, and a black rock t-shirt. Next day, you'd wake up, you would just change the shirt. So I pretty much had this uniform, and my friends, we were all rocking this, but it was just a different rock band every day. One day, it would be Skid Row. The next day, Britney Fox. Next day, Warrant. Next day, Metallica, and we would rotate that. That was, again, for me, 1988, 89, metal got big, huge, Bon Jovi, groups that were around before, 
that were kind of building and all of a sudden new wave was going out and then hello here comes hair bands love me some hair bands to this day and they're back one album that i talk about a great deal in my first podcast is uh, guns and roses when that album came out appetite for destruction up until that time i started guitar lessons when i was in grade school so the guitar used to be huge on me a big yellow hondo guitar that i had and i kept playing that so i had my chops come high school heavy metals happening guitar huge so i i rocked out a lot to the metal indeed uh, the appetite for destruction album something about those guys when i was young i looked at that my parents were like they thought I was a devil worshiper because I had the posters of Guns N' Roses and Axl Rose and Slash, Izzy, Duff McKagan. Uh, here are these guys that are intimidating and scary to my parents. They're rock and roll dudes. But th I was entering the whole rebellious stage of my life and I could identify with them. Long live hair bands and rock and roll. And I could play that album on guitar from beginning, middle, to end. I would tune an E flat to them. I would press play on my CD player and ha huh, I would play that album and blast out the neighborhood. Speaking of CD players and going back to technology a bit. In the early 80s everything was tapes and records. I loved tapes because I had a tape player. Records were okay. The quality was a lot better. I didn't really realize it that much. I do now. Vinyl is awesome. But we had tapes and records. And now CDs happen. CDs happened. My dad bought a CD player before it was big. It was the new stuff. A CD, a compact disc. I will never forget going to a store in my hometown of Worcester, Ohio called Far East Audio. My father and I walked into this store. And the owner, I'll never forget, he says, hey, I got something cool for you guys. You ready to check this out? My dad and I looked at each other like, what? My dad had heard of CDs and stuff, but this guy had one. He had a couple in the store for sale. We go in this room, in the back room, where they had the like soundproof whatever, and he presses play on this CD. We were freaking out because it was so clear. There was no hiss, no buzz. The CD, wow. How much does this cost, right? So my dad, being the connoisseur of music, classical, opera, he loves high fidelity. And he had bought a CD player. And I believe it was between seven or eight hundred dollars. I mean, it was an investment. And this was before you could just go to the store and buy a ton of CDs. It was in its infancy. So we had a CD player in the home. And we only had a few CDs. Uh, they would come with this sample CD. And it was a big deal because they didn't scratch, or so we thought. I mean, you know, you could do all this stuff with it. And I had a CD player in the home. And time went by. and. We had CDs and CDs and CDs and some more CDs. By the late 80s, it was a much cheaper because they charged too much for the players in the beginning and realized that's why no one was buying them. So they had CDs out. That became the new. Now, let's go back to fashion. Hope you guys are keeping up with me here. Jumping topics a bit. Fashion. Where would we go to buy our clothes? You had your TJ Maxx, you had your stores, you had the, the normal stuff. But if you were a kid in the mid-80s, late 80s, you would go to the mall. The mall was the place to go to. For me, there was a few malls around, but the one that everybody went to was called Rolling Acres Mall in Akron, Ohio. It was about 40 minutes or so from my hometown and it was a hangout we would go to the mall just to go to the mall it wasn't like oh i'm definitely gonna buy this or, there were times we did that but it was you every your friends you would go there it was like a club that mall was just bopping in the the 80s and that's where I buy my clothes there's a store called the county seat that's where i got my homecoming outfit folks if you remember the county seat Going to that store for to pick out my homecoming outfit. What did I choose? I have a picture. There's evidence of this photo. And it's very funny now. My hair. By that time, I grew it long. They call it a mullet now, but back then it was just long hair. 
It looked like Joe Elliott from uh, Def Leppard. I was rocking that look. Short in the front, long in the back. They'd say business in the front, party in the back. That was my hairstyle. And I had a pink, yes, a pink button-up shirt with gray stripes on it with a gray blazer and pleated gray pants. Kind of an MC Hammer thing going on a little bit. And to top it all off, I had a skinny black tie that went down my chest. That was my outfit for homecoming but that I bought at the county seat. But cool and trendy and of the time. Laughable now, cool at the time, like a lot of this stuff. Something else we rocked a lot were uh, fanny packs. I had a killer fanny pack, also known as a hip pack. Old people would use them. They still do. It's kind of coming back. Leather ones. They would put it in the front, and people would use it to as a purse or whatever and put their change in. For us, we put it on the side. It's always cool on the side. I mean, mine had like skulls and stuff, but I still had one. I probably had one a little longer than I should have because people were like, you still wear that? Guilty of that. But then I graduated, I think, to a leather one. I went to, I think it was Wilson's leather store maybe Berman's at the mall and I rocked the fanny pack because it was a cool place to keep my money and my stuff and we had a lot of bracelets that's what was cool once a uh, new wave I mean that was happening the whole heavy metal thing there was a mix guys could wear I wore a lot of bracelets and that was okay and hair men were hair spraying their hair and some of these metal bands look at poison I bought that album when it first came out. Look what the cat dragged in. I mean, it looks like there's four women on the cover. The makeup was happening. That was the 80s. Fun. Fashion was on fire. Color. Hair. Music. Movies. I saw a few concerts during the 80s. First one I ever went to, my first big concert, was Michael Jackson. That was October 20th, 1984 at the Cleveland Stadium outside. And it was a big deal because Michael Jackson was huge. So at the time it was like seeing Elvis or something. And it was the victory tour. So the Jackson Five had the reunion and everybody pretty much was there to see Michael Jackson. And he did a few songs from Thriller, but for the most part it was this reunion tour. And we were so far back that he was, you know, the size of a peanut. He was really small, but it counted. We saw the King of Pop back in the day. Uh, the next concert I saw on my birthday, so that would have been July 10th of 1986 at Blossom Music Center was the Monkees, the Monkees reunion tour. It was their 20th anniversary and that was big because I grew up listening to the Monkees before I even discovered the Beatles and that was thrilling. On MTV, they played their show of the Monkees kind of a variety show comedy thing with sketches and and towards the end of the 80s I saw in 1987 again at the Cleveland Stadium the U2 Joshua Tree Tour which was big I got into U2 during that time and I discovered their earlier music and U2 was a, just an amazing band during the 80s because they were so timeless and they still are to this day I mean if you look at pop music during that time, it was completely different than what U2 was putting out. And really with the Joshua Tree, that album was ginormous and it was different. If you look at a song like With or Without You, compared to some of the stuff that was going on during that time, it's pretty wild. But they are timeless. Their elements are, you know, guitar, bass guitar, vocals, and drums and the edge would play keyboards once in a while so it was really this tight knit group that i've seen several times in concert since then but uh i remember the next day my mom let my brother and i have the day off school because we got home so late so props to her that was nice of her i still have so much of my 80s stuff why do i have so much of my 80s stuff i'm not a hoarder i promise maybe i am i still have a lot of 80 stuff surrounding me. However, what happened is when I graduated high school, right away my dad said, okay, you have to be out of the house, you know? 
you're 18 now, you got to do something with your life. And thank goodness, looking back that he did this. So what did I do? I did, I had some money and I, I bought a small home and I was teaching guitar full time at the time. This was 1992. But I got a storage shed because I went in panic mode. He said, you got to be out. So I got a storage shed. And in that storage shed, I took everything that I had for a short time. And I threw it all in the storage shed. All my games, toys, clothes, everything I had and put it in there. Well, ended up getting my little first home. And a lot of stuff stayed in that shed. So that storage shed that I would rent became a time capsule and still kind of is. In fact, not that long ago, I've at libraries, I've been touring an exhibit of mine called Big Wave, fun from the 80s. And it's showcases filled with 80s memorabilia. Everything I've been talking about, the Rubik's Cubes, Garfield stuff, jean jacket, boom boxes, tapes, VHS stuff. Anyhow, it's a, an exhibit that tours and uh, all these objects from my shed, I put on display. So that is pretty much why I still have a lot of that stuff. And uh, it's fun to look at. To me, they're all memories. Everything has a story. Every item, every board game, my fame board game or my fame lunchbox. I know when I got it, there's a story. There's an emotional attachment to that object. And that's what's kind of fun if you're collecting something, no matter what it is. That's why people collect. A lot of optimism, a lot of happiness in the 80s. And I like to think of my family in the 80s. I mean, my family's not what it used to be. In the 80s, my mom was alive. She had passed away in 1990, April 9th, 1990. So I have a lot of fond memories of my mother in the 80s because she was with it. I talked about Guns N' Roses earlier. She wasn't afraid of that type of music. She would take my cassette. She was a, re a nurse turned realtor and she had a Lincoln Continental that she got used as part of her real estate stuff. And she would play these tapes, Guns N' Roses. She liked that album. She'd play that in between going to appointments for her real estate stuff. So I have a lot of fond memories of that and my mom in the 1980s, she always had trendy hairstyles. And my dad, he was kind of just, you know, he was a successful doctor and he wore pretty much picture Chevy Chase in the Christmas vacation, you know, suit and tie during the day and then maybe like a, a flannel at night. But my mom, she would rock the trendy hairstyles and she was with it. She wasn't afraid to express herself and so I have lots of fond memories of that. She was alive during that decade and all the memories and, you know, turned 1990 when she passed away, 80s were gone and yeah, so I have a lot of fond memories. I mean, after 1990, the 90s started and people brushed the 80s away. A lot of those bands just fizzled. Hair bands weren't cool anymore and certainly a lot of the new wave pop groups like Duran Duran, I mean, they kept going and I kept digging their music but they weren't touring arenas Pearl Jam Nirvana the 90s happened grunge happened which was fine because at that time I was still 18 19 20 in the the early 90s and I dug some of it it kind of worked because I was still skateboarding and punk was still kind of alive and uh that's the change that happened in the 1990s. Things got darker. You know, Woodstock 90s. That was Mudfest. And time to change. The 80s had so much color and now we're in the 90s. But that's a different podcast. If you didn't experience the 80s, you have my condolences. I'm sorry. No. All jokes aside... It's a bummer because maybe your parents or whoever, the 80s were a great, great time. And as you can tell, I mean, I'm sentimental about it and I could swim in it for hours. I still listen to a lot of 80s music and I still watch all those movies. Some may say I'm stuck in time, but so what? If I had a time period to be stuck in, without a doubt, this would be the one. All right, everybody. Are you ready to get back into that time machine DeLorean? and go to the present, you know what?
I think I'm going to wait. I'm going to stay here just a little bit longer and enjoy this. So, as Doc Brown from Back to the Future would say, your future is whatever you make it. So make it a good one. All right, everybody. Until next time, this is Doug Brown signing off from Method Airwaves. Stay positive and take care. <laughs>